Culture in its many ways that it unfolds is very important because culture is the fabric that envelops everything. Culture is cohesion. Culture is how people understand themselves and what makes them happy. That is one thing that we all have in common with our brother, with our neighbor, with our sister, who we may share a little else in common with. I think it's an extremely important piece of all social movements and in particular ones that were spawned by marginalized groups of people. So today, authentic legacy cannabis culture, the kind of culture that's been built by people who fell in love with this uh, plant decades ago and have spent their lifetimes dedicated to understanding it, has a really important role to play now, especially because millions and millions of people around the world who have never experienced cannabis are being introduced to it. And many, many people, a lot of the cannabis industry, today's cannabis industry, is being developed and is being managed by people who are really interested in money, not because they have any kind of close connection to the plant. There's this other part of the culture that I think that appreciates that it is a plant, it's something growing, um, it, has, uh, it can be used in a way that really truly helps people. And that is something that I think is very important because I think it's being threatened with what I'm going to call uh, corporate America or even international companies wanting to uh, make a lot of money off of cannabis at this point. So you have a whole population of people who need to be educated about the plant, but the companies, for the most part, who are going to be providing the products to them don't understand the plant themselves. So this is where legacy cannabis culture comes in. It binds everyone together through every socioeconomic strata, through every kind of division in America, we find cannabis. Culture is super important. It's how people understand the differences between each other. You listen to one country song, Big and Rich has one song. You're not really part of the culture if you're only listening to that one country bit of country music because you're not aware of the entire genre, the ups, the downs, the different ways that country music can be presented. So if you happen to know one thing, that's like knowing about Blue Dream and thinking you know everything about cannabis. It's what we share. That doesn't show any effort into exploring the culture fully. We achieve greatness through cohesion. Culture is the glue. Culture is the glue that keeps everything together. I am Amanda Ryman and I appreciate cannabis because it brings perspective to my life. I'm Tim Blake. I'm grateful and honored for cannabis to be part of my life for the healing aspects, the inspiration, uh, what it does for me across the board. It's, uh, it's involved in every aspect of my life. I, the Dank Duchess, absolutely appreciate every bit of cannabis as it brings peace and balance into my life. My name is Joshua Freeman, also known as Silverback Gorilla in the industry, founder of Grow Willow Goods and Roots and Harmony Farms. I cultivate cannabis and enjoy it for its sacrament and medicinal purposes. Being told that it wasn't okay as a kid like was a huge thing for me. It made me very curious to figure out what it is that I'm not supposed to have. I mean, my parents are very conservative. I was 100% anti-cannabis. Nancy Reagan told me, say no drugs. I got tired of watching my friends do a long time in prison. All I had to depend on was my brain power because I had grown up really funny looking and really just, just really, really funny looking. So what I had was my brains. And so I wasn't gonna do anything that might 
<laughs> make me lose my brains, just like Nancy Reagan said. Uh, I have PTSD because I faced a couple you know, long prison terms. Uh, I, I uh, send letters and money to people with long-term prison sentences, and I watch the horror of their lives. I watch patients like my uncle Bill not have access to medicine, not feel comfortable using that medicine. And after I healed myself with using cannabis from stage, uh, not stage four, but metastasized bone cancers and serious you know, immune issues, I realized that you know, we've got to make this comfortable for the elderly, for the, the kids, for the women, for everybody to use that without being demonized. I was a math major in college, and, uh, and I met this guy. And so we're together two and a half years, and I'm berating him about all this weed usage. I mean, I'm really kind of terrible. And then one day, literally the weed spoke to me. It was in a piece of, in a, a nice, a really nice glass shaped like a teardrop. And it almost said like, just, just have me. So I went with it and I took a, a puff and immediately did some calculus. And I realized that they lied. It was that simple. I really came to cannabis through the racial injustices of the drug war. That was my first piece of interest. See, I, I really felt literal, like, like suddenly my brain power, I don't even know why I took that jump then, but suddenly my brain power would be all gone. I did some difficult calculus right after that. And I said, these people lied. And once I realized how good I felt that first day, because it only took one day, one, one day and one set of puffing, that I was just like, all right, now I'm on this cannabis thing. So I was not cannabis. Like Monday, Tuesday, I was pro-cannabis. I had read about things like the crack cocaine sentencing disparity laws, about mandatory minimums, about the fact that college students were denied funding because they had drug convictions. And so that's where my interest started. And as I started to do more research on that, I felt that cannabis was kind of this entree into talking about the harms of the drug war. And then I was growing within like three months because I was so pro-cannabis that it was costing me a ridiculous amount of money. So then I, I needed to grow, grow weed. It was a substance that many people had tried. It was the most frequently used illicit substance. It was a substance that more and more people felt shouldn't be illegal. And I felt this is an opportunity to meet people where they're at with a substance that they know to say, hey, we're sitting here consuming cannabis. Isn't this great? Don't you know there's someone in jail for life just a few states away for doing this same thing? I'm an advocate because of the lies. Like literally, it's cruel that Americans, my grandmother has dementia, my grandmother is in New York. And I'll be honest, I was sending, before it was legal to be able to do that, sending CBD and THC to my grandmother because there's no reason that she should like feel so terrible in New York, but if she was in California with me, that she'd be doing better. We're all supposed to be American. And, you know, lo and behold, it really did become that catalyst to talk about the drug war. And now you're seeing all of these federal electeds talk about how socially unjust the drug war is. And that really spawned from the activism around cannabis. That's why I'm an advocate. Once I realized that they were lying, once I realized that, like, we could literally save so many people in so many different ways, and they're lying. They're literally lying. And when they're not lying, they're putting a chokehold on the situation. So it's just like, all right, well, you can have it, but only for this situation. Or you can have it, but only this amount. Or you can have it, but only if you look like this. That's like a whole set of bullshit lies. And if we all, all of us, every single one of us who has a mouth to say something, can say something, then that lie will eventually die. And that's why I do it. I'm Patty O'Brien and I am a huge advocate for cannabis and it brings a lot of joy to my life to be able to help patients who need access. It's been at the foundation of everything I've done. The spirit of cannabis is what literally just moves you to fight the red tape and the regulations every single day. I, Jake Sassman, am in love with cannabis because it brings joy and community and purpose to my life. I've been giving money to normal since I was 16. There was a uh, meeting at the state capitol. I was tired. I didn't want to go. I was just exhausted. 
And I said, okay, well, I'm going to get up and commute two hours away to get into Sacramento to support. Uh, at that time, it was SBA 29, was the compassion bill, which is now SB 34. But, I, you know, I got up and I sat in the room. I was so tired. And then the line of people that went to the podium to speak on behalf of compassion, there was this woman there who brought her three-year-old grandson who had leukemia and he was so immunocompromised that he had face mask on and it was, uh, sorry, I get tears, but it was, that's the reason why you get up every day. I think that in this day and age, people would rather give their money to the farmer that they've trusted for decades rather than give their money to Marlboro or any of these you know, huge companies that are trying to cash in. On, on culture, on social injustice. I, Rich Moskowitz, love cannabis because it has been a partner in my life since for the last four plus decades. We have to understand the power of the purse, right? So this is where the community comes in. You get up and do it for those who can't. People have died because of no access. If we all choose together that someone is not expressing the soul, the plan, or proper cannabis community values, then we can't choose if they're in the business or not, but we can certainly vote with our dollars, vote with our mouths. I, Joseph, love cannabis and it brings joy to my life. I, Christopher Christensen, uh, appreciate cannabis as a natural substance as it brings uh, a remedy for many things. I am Johnny Rootweaver and I love cannabis because it brings purpose to my life. I, Trish Herrera Spencer, support the legalization and destigmatization of cannabis as it brings uh, security and peace uh, to my life. I'm Steve D'Angelo and I love cannabis because it brings joy to my life. Prop 64 uh, reminds me of this uh, book that was written about Michelangelo called The Agony and the Ecstasy, right? The Agony and the Ecstasy of Prop 64. I have really, really mixed feelings about it. This has been a period of time that has ripped my heart down the middle. Legalization, it's a, it's a, it's a double issue because you can't put money from cannabis into banks. And so the vast majority of people that have been protecting this plant so that it can be recognized as medicine through the risks over the last few decades, uh, they're being left behind because they have no way to legitimize their money, even though it's being legitimized by people that have never had anything to do with it at all. And so I'm watching people that have helped support entire communities lose their farms, and it's starving out thousands of people. And it's all being left for big marketing. It's because soccer moms wanted to be able to buy a dab pen from 7-Eleven and go on their way, and they didn't realize that they were they were voting for them to have access and voting to take the farm away from the farmer. I am truly concerned you're going to end up with a handful of companies. I mean, how many places do you go to buy coffee? Starbucks? Pete's? Uh, there's a few other ones. I'm going to guess, uh, you know, most people are going to name at most one or two. I'm very concerned that that is the future of cannabis. And we see it, we actually see it in regards to who does the applications, uh, the connection. If you, do, if you do research on who is getting the dispensary licenses, they're, they're quite often you see the same names. Prop 64 is not something that was written to help support the established culture. 
no matter. As Prop 64 was coming forward, I was a big fan of a different model. Um, unfortunately, in the run-up, that model went away, and I was left with Prop 64. And again, as I say, I think I, my vote was not so much for 64, but for the rest of the world to understand the cannabis plant is and always has been in simpatico with humanity. I think Prop 64 is actually pulling away from the culture here in California. 64 is a really tough one. Uh, I advocated for it. I did from the stage of the Emerald Cup. There's a lot of farmers that rightfully were against that. A lot of product makers, a lot of people that were very concerned and rightfully concerned. Because of those reasons I'd stated before about the need to get medicine to uh, everyday people, to get people out of prison, to stop that, you know, I went ahead with 64. Because we've grown up in this place where we saw all these sizzling egg commercials and dare and we were told all of these lies for so long, there's people who, who love cannabis, who know cannabis, who use it every day, who are still sometimes really tortured by their use. They have this, they have this conflict inside them. And I remember like, one example of this, this beautiful, beautiful guy. He was a devout Christian, a born-again Christian, right? Goes to church every single day of the week. And before he went to church, he liked to take a, a toke, one toke on a pipe of cannabis to open his heart and his spirit before he goes into church. But the church and the preacher were not groovy with cannabis, right? They were really down on cannabis. And so, I was with him and he was really tortured and, and, and he's, he didn't know what to do because he knew that the cannabis helped him, but he also felt guilty about using it. And I just laid a little bit of history on him and talked about how different schools of religion for thousands of years, right, from, from the Hindus uh, to the Muslims to Hebrews to early Christians, have used cannabis as a sacrament and, and, and that that's one of its most ancient purposes. There's a history, you know, with, with this plant and how it's been used. And, and once I laid that history on him and told him about it and he could look at it through this different kind of a lens, it was like this huge weight became lifted off of his shoulders, right? So I'd like to see that lingering stoner shame taken off of everybody's back. They say that like uh, the holy anointing oil uh, in the Bible, the plant that, that's referenced, some people say, is cannabis. To finally see this plant legal, to see every adult in the state of California be able to walk into a dispensary and get clean, tested, legal cannabis and not have to worry about getting arrested, to know that cops no longer have this convenient excuse to go after people who are black or brown or people who look weird like me. There's burial tombs with cannabis inside the tombs that are thousands of years old. There's, you know, so this relationship's old. There's times when I even forget that it's happened. It's like I'll be sitting somewhere, I'll be like getting ready to smoke a joint or roll a joint or something and I'll be hunching my shoulders and I'll be looking around and I'll go, dude, it's legal, chill, right? And so that's beautiful. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I have a one acre permit um, application in with Sonoma County. What's really hard is that the regulations that have been, been put into place um, are making it almost impossible for most of the legacy cannabis companies to stay in existence in the state of California. It is an extinction event for many of the people who were most responsible, who made the sacrifices to bring us to the place that we are today. And that is a tragedy. I was lucky to have a budget that could afford an attorney to deal with it because it really is way over my head, particular, in particularly, I'm not too interested in the bureaucracy of that stuff. Never have been one to follow those kind of things. So having to adapt into that, I've needed to hire people to help me do it. It's very expensive. It was uh, almost $17,000 just for the application fee. That doesn't even approve you. And then to hire an attorney was, you know, the fee that we were set. But um, that's just the tip of the iceberg, too, really. I quit a full-time nursing job to get the company licensed. And so 
that certainly put a dent in my lifestyle because I've got two kids, I'm a single mom, so it was very difficult to uh, have worked as hard as I did to, to, to get a career in nursing and then have to quit a career in nursing to see this project all the way through to the other side. Well, again, it comes to the margins because the application costs X amount and the taxes for an outdoor uh, acre are $2 a square foot. That totals almost $90,000 I paid the county this year. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. It doesn't matter how much you harvest, how much you grow, what kind of price, prices you're getting per pound, it doesn't matter. They still get their $2 a square foot. I've been asked if there's one thing you could change about Prop 64, what would it be? And I think it's kind of a boring answer, but we did not categorize the size of cultivation correctly in Prop 64. We categorized it by square footage. And when you look at the license types for cultivation, they're categorized by square footage. When you look at the fee schedules, they're categorized by square footage. We did not take into account that not everybody grows this plant seasonally. And that the amount of cannabis that can be produced from an indoor grow with six harvests a year is way more than the cannabis that's gonna be produced in the same square footage for somebody who's a seasonal farmer. That being said, it's just set up in a way to make any small guy fail. It's almost impossible unless you can produce your pounds for, I want to say, 300 or less. So if I had to go back, I would make it all based on production level. I would say how much you pay, what you have to do is all based on how much you're producing per year, not how big your plot is. And I think we just didn't know. We didn't think about the fact that this was much more of a two-dimensional issue. Um, we thought of it more as just the size of a field, like any other crop. But this isn't any other crop because prohibition has driven it inside. So if I had to go back, I would make things based on production value versus square footage. Because we have been selling our pounds at 500 and less. But we're working on that and hopefully we'll be able to, to fix that. When Prop 64 came in after we voted it in, and I saw at the beginning of the implementation, of course, like everyone else, last minute donations, changing the intent of the laws and all these things were really problematic. And people started talking about, do you regret your vote? And I was firm in my stance. I said, no. I call it manning up, unfortunately because I firmly believe that if California wouldn't have done this, then we wouldn't have seen the rest of the world have the ability to legalize cannabis, because it was the United States who drove them down that road to begin with. So California, in some way, I said, had to take it on the chin for the rest of the world. Now, we did take it on the chin. I mean, hundreds of friends' businesses, hundreds of things. We had, for 20 years, a self-regulated, growing, controlled market that was successfully implemented. Am I a fan of Prop 64? Yeah, I'm absolutely glad to see where legalization is coming into the market for people. One of the things I think that makes it a little bit difficult to say I'm in support of is the high taxes here in California. It's driving a lot of businesses, you know, to the black market. They're not able to keep up with the compliance aspect on a build out, regulatory process, licensing fees, payrolls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit sad to see cannabis being made into this big commodity where there's a lot of greed and a lot of money surrounding. I've been offered a few different deals. I have a consulting company that I started three years ago and you know I was doing the trade shows and I've been up into Washington and different states in or and helping out different outfits up there I got a taste and touch of what it what's happening with corporate uh, takeover and I felt like my intellectual property was being taken from me and not valued in a way that should have been and I felt really manipulated from the beginning we were promised that it'd be no large-scale agriculture for five years they'd stand down on that that went away after two months of legalization Back when we first were growing marijuana, you know, 25, 30 years ago, it was really important to have another guy or two or people just growing weed because it was strength in numbers. They said they'd protect the small farmers and protect the small product makers, and then they turned around and made all the product makers go to large-scale manufacturers to be able to create their products that they've been doing in their homes for 40 years because they don't trust us. You know, it wasn't just about yourself. It was just about getting the plant to the people and growing enough of it, too. 
It's all about trust. So instead of giving the small product makers and the cultivators a chance to slowly run their careers out, they're facing a demise overnight. Within a year, most of these people are now going under because they're fighting against large-scale agriculture in Salinas and in Santa Barbara. They're looking at manufacturers that have wherewithal that they can't compete with. So we shared information, we shared techniques, we shared strength. And nowadays, that, that's not happening as much because there's a sense of uh, disrespect you know, by corporations or people that are coming in to do this now. I've gone to the VCC meetings and I've lobbied, and even though I have a manufacturing license and a manufacturing plant, I said, I don't want to make those people have to come to me so I can make more money off them. They should be able to do it at their homes. They, they fought for 20 years to do this illegally and you're taking it away from them. And so, as much as I've tried to not be disparaging of the VCC and the state, uh, I think that overall we were snookered. Uh, I don't think that they've uh, done what they said they would do. Somebody offered to buy my farm this year and then hire me as the brand ambassador and to run it. And uh, it was very tempting. So it's a really tough thing because on the one side I'm so excited about all the, the growth that's coming in and all the acceptance and all the wonderful parts of what I wanted for 64. When you're looking at all the uh, paperwork and all the logistics of trying to become legal, it's pretty daunting and scary. So to shoulder that all on my own has been um, it's been stressful, very stressful. And we really owed it to the people that created this industry to not screw them. And that's what they did. And uh, I faced that every day with people questioning why I did 64 and, and with them feeling like this was going to happen and, and uh, how it rolled out. So, uh, you know, I'd give them a D. I'd give the BCC and the state a D for how they dealt with this. Big business is really here already, even though they're not supposed to. We're supposed to have a five-year a window where we can establish ourselves as growers before corporates here, but they are finding ways to come in and they're coming in with promises and, and uh, this and that. Some of it's true, some of it's not true, but they're not after anything but a dollar. They have no interest in our community or where we even come from, our, you know, our values as a, as a group. And that's totally a disgrace because that's what made marijuana marijuana. 64 is basically just a, a corporate takeover and that's not what cannabis is about. It's about healing and it's about community and friendship and bringing people together. I've seen a lot of people turn against each other. Prop 64 w was, was a lot of lies, right? It was a lot of lies and it's only now that we're seeing how much lies it is. Every Almost everybody that I know in the industry has been negatively affected. Up around my ranch, a lot of people were turned in by other neighbors, me being one. Uh, you know, I had already entered into the permit process here in Sonoma County. Some of the neighbors didn't know that, so uh, the county got called and of course I got put under the microscope and a lot of scrutiny on me. Like, I know so many people have lost farms. I know hash makers who just haven't made hash over years. Real messed up. In a way, I feel like the culture is totally evaporating because the things that we used to all uphold, like privacy and strength, and no one used to narc on each other. And if you did, it was a major issue. You were kicked out of the community immediately. There's, there's this attitude that, oh, this guy doesn't have a license, so it's cool if I call up the city or I call up uh, the BCC or I call up the state and rat them out. No, that's not cool. <laughs> that's not what cannabis is about. It's about working together. Instead of forming like farmers alliances and these kind of things, people are, are just becoming separate. For folks that were manufacturing in their garages and now the state is expecting them to be in a commercial manufacturing facility, that is definitely a lot more difficult. And no, I don't think they're getting the support they need, primarily because a lot of local economic development institutions are federally funded. So they're not allowed to work with cannabis businesses. They're not allowed to get small business loans. They're not allowed to work with banks. And so all of these things on top of the regulatory hurdles make it really difficult for the smaller producers to be successful. I hope that the veteran farmer 
and hash maker and edible maker still has a place in the future. But if they don't, I think uh, safe access to consumption uh, is imperative to, to keeping the culture alive. My business, like, like uh, any legacy cannabis business that wants to survive, has been in a process of change for the past year. All of this is because of 64. Um, our decisions used to be ruled mostly by our hearts, by our emotions, by our connection to the plant, by the values that the plant taught us. And we were living in this kind of gray market, unregulated, semi-legal, but not totally legal kind of environment. And everyone's complaining about the high price now and uh, their, their favorite seshes, you know, going away. That freedom has largely been taken away with us with the transition to a completely legal marketplace and the entry of uh, investors and very sophisticated executive teams who have not hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars, right? but tens of millions of dollars behind them uh, in order to establish new businesses. That was all in the fine print. That's not what they sold you. I've had to adjust to that new reality. And now a lot of our decisions are driven by the need to compete, the need to survive. And uh, we are working to keep as much of that traditional cannabis culture, the values that the plant has taught us uh, in our business as we possibly can. But the way that we express those values is changing. I'll give you an example. Uh, over the last 12 years, we spent five and a half million dollars providing completely 100% free holistic healing services to anybody who walked into Harborside. We didn't even ask them how much money they made or whether they could afford to pay for it or not. Well, now we do. We have a sliding scale arrangement where folks who can afford to pay for those services are going to be asked to pay for those services. Folks who can't afford to pay the full freight will get a greatly reduced rate so that we try and keep the spirit of generosity of helping each other intact, but we do it in a way so that we can survive, that we can continue to be present in a competitive environment. Your average voter and your average smoker goes to the poll and they're like, legal weed, hell yeah, but you know, you're looking at the fine print, it's like they didn't tell you this shit was going to be $20 more an eighth. Uh, they didn't tell you that your favorite brands are going to disappear. Cannabis is definitely going to be pushed into rigid control. Oakland used to be looked at as like the safe haven and capital for uh, cannabis businesses and cannabis use. If you don't have the ability to express yourself and legitimize your product as somebody that has a lot of money, you're going to be pushed either into the black market completely or weeded out. Now it's looked at uh, as a cash cow by the city. I think it's important that we protect uh, the mom and pop aspect of uh, cannabis. I'd like to see these massive corporations somehow really barred. I'd like to see the big corporate takeover of not only cannabis, but every aspect of society be knocked down. Really that medical compassion aspect is the most important factor in cannabis culture. I didn't think we'd see it so quick with cannabis, and now you're already looking at Constellation and Coca-Cola and these huge companies. You know, there's, there's countries that have banned uh, Philip Morris from operating. And there's uh, countries, I believe, like France, that won't do business with Monsanto. And we shouldn't be doing business with, with these companies either. If they start genetically modifying cannabis so that it has pesticides in its genes like they do with some of the other agricultural crops, and then they bend the rules to allow for these pesticides to be in our consumptions like they did with cigarettes, then there will be cancer coming out of cannabis in the future. Under 0.3 THC, you can sell CBD across the country and all over the place. So you got all these people making these CBD products. They're not whole plant extract. 
all of the cannabinoids working together have a much higher therapeutic value than any one cannabinoid isolated by itself. And when you have true medicine that heals you, then you're like, wow, my arthritis did go away. My epilepsy did go away. I'm getting my brain regenerated. You're seeing all this hemp that's being turned into CBD and all these large scale people doing it, there's no testing, there's no regulation, people are just making bank. We're being tested at levels, restricted levels that no agricultural products have ever been tested at. Has anyone tested watermelons or oranges or anything, grapes or anything like that? What kind of percentage of those come back, I wonder? Stop toxifying us with all the pollution, the vaccines, the chemtrails, the water, the food. Don't allow people to make food that kills our kids. Why is that allowed? Those people should be in prison for crimes against humanity, and yet you're gonna go pick on the cannabis people. We take our money and we funded Greenpeace. We fund liberal politicians. We bring cops up here to talk so we can come together. So it's really up to the community to do so. We funded the alternative part of this world. I don't think that we're getting the tools that we need, and yes, I feel like I'm one of the people that should be getting those tools. Most legacy cannabis companies are finding themselves short on some of the skill sets and the financial resources that they need to negotiate this new reality. Because in, in, in the world that we grew up in, we didn't have an opportunity to develop some of the skills that are really critical today. Finance. Well, in, in the world that we grew up in, the federal government was still raiding us and prosecuting us and locking us up. And if you kept financial records, that could be evidence to put you in, to you in, in prison. So we didn't become very adept with keeping financial records, right? Uh, compliance. Well, there weren't any regulations for us to comply with. So we didn't have compliance de departments, right? It was only until now that we had regulations. So there are skill sets that legacy cannabis companies have not had the opportunity to develop that are really important moving into the future. The first change was financial and business and cutting the mom and pops out and everything that we all thought was a reasonable accommodation to put in, that was the first change. That affects the culture and the community. I've always been pro-legalization. I can't necessarily say that I've always been an advocate of uh, the way that Prop 64 was written, uh, but I definitely, yeah, I believe that, you know, in the long term, I would like to see people not have to um, keep secrets. I believe in having open disclosures on a medical forum. So I believe Prop 64 has at least done a good job in paving a pathway to uh, being open about cannabis usage. It's really important for folks to understand the difference between legalization and regulation. So legalization just means this is no longer an illegal activity. And that is something that was very, very important because people were going to jail for cannabis and they were overwhelmingly poor people of color. So legalization was an absolute crucial step as it remains in all the states where cannabis is still prohibited. And neither have we had an opportunity to really interact with the investor class because until very recently, most investors would turn around and run the other way if they saw somebody who was selling weed, uh, not embrace them as an opportunity. After legalization comes the question, okay, now that it's no longer a crime, how's it gonna work as a business? And that's where the regulations stepped in. And those regulations are gonna vary depending on the state you're in. Maine's regulations are gonna look different than California's regulations. They're gonna look different than Colorado's because all of our states regulate business differently. What we have going on here in California is a crash between the culture and the fact that California does business in a way that's almost a slap in the face to that very culture. The tools really are gonna be all of us farmers coming together and working together as one, as an alliance, and, and different regions will be able to do that so that we can set prices and we can also buy in bulk together and just ways that we can make it through this transition because in the next four or five years when corporate comes in, it's gonna be really tough. And I believe that 
that's going to be the break or breaking point is if we can actually come together, make it a breaking point is if we can come together. The process of, of getting the licenses that we got, just the process of applying for them uh, in a way that gave us confidence that they would be granted was very time consuming. It required a lot of outside legal help. It was expensive. It was a challenge in itself. We've gone through all the challenges and the pain and suffering and the financial distress that everybody else has trying to get those permits and stand up to them and get them done. It has not been easy. Uh, it's been the most challenging couple of years of my life. The cost of complying with the regulations as they have been coming into effect have been huge. They've required many, many changes in the way that we operate, who we can do business with, what kind of products we can sell, how we can display those products, um, whether or not we can, how we can promote those products. Uh, we used to give products away for free when we did promotions. We're not allowed to do that anymore. It's, it's not, it's totally not allowed. We've had to adjust to the tax burden where there's this very high tax burden on the legal cannabis market right now. And, uh, and that's forced us to really think about what kind of products we, we, we have, where we get them, what we pay for them, and make sure that we have affordable options for our, used to call them patients, and now we call them clients. It's a little bit frustrating when you have a vision or you're, you know, this person who really wants to help somebody. and. You've got to get investment money and investors just want to see the bottom line number and it's, it's very difficult to find the funds to help a vision when you've got a lot of red tape and taxes that you have to overcome. You got 25,000 farmers up in the Emerald Triangle up in these areas, you know, we're talking about 90% of them going away. So think about these towns, these small towns and stuff with 90% of the people not making money anymore. And what we see on the other hand now is new cannabis companies coming in. They have all of the skill sets they need to survive in the mainstream business place. They can raise lots of money, but what they miss is the legacy cannabis expertise, the understanding of the plant, the understanding of why people really consume cannabis and what the trends and what the preferences are, right? So this is why, you know, the suits and the OGs we're, we're, we're each half of what's needed to really optimize this plant and bring it to the world. We, we're not going to do it without the suits and the corporations, but if the legacy cannabis culture isn't incorporated into that process, the world's going to be way poorer for it. I think that the market is really going to be driven by large corporations, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping to see those small local farmers stay sustainable. It's critical that they stay involved. Because I think that's uh, where we came from, and I would hate to see that lost in the five years <laughs> forcing this market. I'm actually concerned that more of the focus will be on reducing the number of suppliers so that there are fewer uh, distributors and fewer people making money and, the f and those people making more and more money. I think that's a very serious concern. Coming into the market being a, a white female, I think I have definitely have been blessed in that regard. Um, there's a lot of people of color that I work with in this market that I see that has been far more challenging to get a license than myself. I mean, single parent. My dad was in prison his whole life. I wouldn't say I was super privileged. When you look at the social justice aspects that were addressed by Prop 64, that really was the first proposition to allow for records to be expunged, to protect people in the industry who had cannabis convictions, to set the stage for equity programs that would allow people that have been most impacted to get into the industry, to set aside funding for communities that have been most impacted. That was something we hadn't seen in any other state. And now that we did it, we have states coming after us that are looking to do the same thing. Massachusetts is looking at social equity programs. New York is looking how to put social equity into their eventual legalization. There's definitely a large group of people here in Oakland who have had a very challenging pathway to get licensed. And um, I like to spend a lot of my time, I volunteer a lot of my time with those groups probably written over 12 permits for free to make sure that everybody has access. I keep finding in the cannabis licensing process, both at the state and the local level, that 
People create process without policy, and that's the exact opposite of the way this thing is done. You create policy, and then you build process to fulfill it. And then if the process is problematic, then people can specifically speak to an issue. And both in my city and the state, it seems to me that, okay, we agree, we're gonna put a system in. And then we put a system in, but nobody's ever thought this through. So perhaps a, another great local example is the equity program in Oakland. Absolutely great idea, leading the nation, cutting edge. But where's the, the right process, right? What has been the effect? And so I can only hope as maybe a half full kind of person that this is all new and such. Unfortunately, I'm also a realist and say, yes, this is new with cannabis, but this is not new with business, with government, <laughs> and they should be doing better. So um, I think that behooves all of us, quite honestly, to be activists at any level, whether it's speaking to a neighbor, speaking to our local city, speaking to the state, or when we have an opportunity to face this challenge federally, then speaking with one voice there as well. I think that Alameda is an island community, small community, uh, a community with a lot of uh, professional people that genuinely care about the community and how, how we're going to bring cannabis into the community and reduce the stigma and dispense it in a very safe manner. I think we can do that. We do have people that have great concerns that doubt, doubt us, right? And yet their children can walk past a liquor store or a bar and know that they don't go in. There's still a lot of people who don't want to go to the dispensary. Dispensary prices are out of control. If an eighth is right now costing somewhere between $72 and $95, that's crazy. When you, if you know a grower, for one, you might get it for free or you get it for a reduced price. So the black market, I feel, is going to continue to be sustained while these prices are out of control. I mean, these are prices not even paid for in Florida. $80 eighth. What is that all about? So I think that the black market is going to have a good amount of um, good amount of say, and a, a good portion is going to be taken up by the black market, mainly because the prices of the rec market are really astronomical and way out of the range of many. I mean, if I myself wasn't a grower, my average uh oh is is seven grams. So I'm looking at one hundred and sixty dollars per cigar. No. I'd like to see us move outside of the petrochemical extraction methods. Um, I'm really not happy with that. You know, I'm not objected to having a stronger medicinal experience with marijuana. It's just that petrochemicals and medicine just don't mix. They just don't mix. Me dealing with cannabis in a holistic and mindful way is always at the forefront of my mind. So what I'm going to grow, you know, I'm not going to try to grow a 16 week variety in 11 weeks. That's five weeks that I'm not honoring the plant where it should be, where I'm trying to do something. I'm not going to add any nutrients to speed it along or anything like that. I believe that cannabis doing just fine without us, and I'm just appreciative that I can be within her circle. I feel like being a woman CEO in this industry has really been very challenging when sitting in a large group of men who are used to making decisions by themselves. I'm on the board of an organization called The Initiative that's launching in Portland. It's a cannabis accelerator and incubator for female founded cannabis businesses that gives them um, training in how to work the room, how to ask for money, how to navigate the cannabis space as a woman, and then gives them opportunities to pitch to a fund. Within the cannabis industry, we deal with a lot of sexism. As a woman, as a hash maker, I mean, when I've gone places, now I'm more known, but when I've gone places in the beginning with my husband, people will talk to him, but he's not a hash maker. We have, we have all grown up in a culture that looked at cannabis through a prohibitionist lens. And even those of us who love the plant have kind of absorbed this, right? So one example of this is, is, is the way that stoner culture embraces the idea of getting high, of getting wasted, right? And there's nothing wrong with joy and ecstasy, 
that's a, a normal and desirable part of the human experience. But understanding joy and ecstasy, not as being stoned, not as being wasted, right? but as being part of wellness, uh, being part of a full and a complete life, not looking at cannabis as an intoxicant through this prohibitionist lens, but understanding it as a tool for better living uh, through a holistic lens. I shy away from whenever people say they want to rebrand cannabis. I really shy away from that because I feel like the, those words happen to come out of mouths that seek to sanitize cannabis as if the way cannabis was appreciated pre-legalization was somehow inferior to the way it's being appreciated now. Now it's sophisticated and before it was red eyes. Well, guess what? In your sophistication, you will still get red eyes if that weed is good. The majority of the sessions and things are being pushed really underground. And I think that there needs to be more, more leniency towards the regulations about public sessions because that's how cannabis has survived was the community. In the country fair aspect, in the communal aspect of going to these events, to these sessions, there was a lot more feeling of family. Like now, the only people that you can buy their products at these conferences and places that you look forward to. Some people go to these conferences once a year and are on their farm the entire time. The only people you can have are now the licensed companies. So th the pool has shrunk by so much. And because the pool has shrunk by so much, the people who were making, the people who felt the incentive to push out the new flavors and to go that extra mile, which is not necessarily supported by the bottom line. See, at the end of the day, what craft growers do is not really supported by the bottom line. What I plan on doing on mixing sauce with bubble hash to see what that happens, that might be cost me like 50 grams that I'm playing around with. That is not supported by R&D, you know, that, that's not in the R&D budget for a big company who wants to see a, you know, a black across the line. That's not going to work out. But at the same time, we as the customer, we as the consumers, we as the people who appreciate cannabis, we lose out. We lose out because then it becomes a monoculture of that which is profitable. That's all. That's what cannabis is. Cannabis is now turning into that which is profitable. And if it's not profitable, hmm, too bad. I actually don't support taxing it at a high level. I don't think that it's one of, we don't do that with other drugs. How much of my decision making was influenced by a dollar figure calculation? I would tell you very little. We were living in a different world then. Uh, it was a nonprofit world. It was a world that did not have a lot of very sophisticated business competitors or, or very well financed business competitors. Uh, and in that environment, myself and Harborside uh, were able to, to thrive um, and, uh, and not have to look that closely at the dollar consequences of the decisions that we made. It's very different today. Harborside, like every other company in the California market, has to watch every single penny we spend. We have to think very carefully about every dollar because we're living in a hyper-competitive for-profit market today. And uh, legacy cannabis companies that don't learn how to survive in this new environment are going to be eaten for lunch. I was a huge proponent of legalization from the very first time I've ever smoked. I just believed in it because it just was such a natural, pure medicine that worked for me and, and a lot of other people that I knew that it just felt weird that it would be withheld from us. Uh, I was always a proponent of Prop 64. I am still a proponent of Prop 64 today, despite the agony, the tragedy that I see that it's caused, because it's also created a lot of really, really wonderful things have happened as a result of Prop 64. And I knew, really from the day that I started on this mission decades ago, that if we made cannabis legal, then the mainstream business community was going to get involved in it. That's the trade-off. But for me, my allegiance, the thing that I want to accomplish most is to make sure that every single person on this planet that needs and can benefit from cannabis has it in a free, accessible, and legal way. And I don't really care 
who gets rich off of it and who gets the lion's share of the wealth from it. Right? And if I can convince global corporations to take this plant and use their influence and get laws changed and move this thing all around the world, then to me, that's a, that's, that's a wonderful benefit. That's a triumph. It's not a defeat. I'm happy that everything's legal, but I am really unhappy with the way I've seen the reaction within our community to the legalization. Like I said, just, there's just a loss of team. There's a loss of family. Um, it's becoming more and more segregated and, and cutthroat. And uh, that's because it's all dollar driven instead of heart driven, like where we come from. Where, where I come from. If you don't, at the end of the day, understand why people were willing to go to jail for this, why people were willing to die, and it only seems like the only green you care about is the dollars, then you're just never going to get the best out of the plan, and you're just never going to understand it. And you're always going to be on the outside sounding like, it's so lit. They're still looking at us like they can't trust us, like they've got to restrict us. They can't let us make products at home. They've got to weigh every gram. We did a defo crop and we found out that we have to take 3,000 plants and individually weigh them, keep them separated, trim them up, and keep the shake separated. Could you imagine doing that with apples or with a vineyard or anything? Do you know the time and energy and money that's costing us because of a lack of trust? And it's like, you know what? We need to make this industry grow. California is one of the most regulated, restricted industries and, or you know, states in the country. As good as we are, we have such overregulation that we've got to open it up and have some trust and some faith and let this plant fly. The interesting part about cannabis, um, cigarettes, they don't have any medicinal value, zero. Cannabis does. Are we going to thrive? Are we going to stand up to the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies and the political powers that be as a humanity? Or are we going to let them continue to make our families and our loved ones sick and die while they suck us dry and don't give us a fair wage and don't share the wealth of this world? I'd like to see, you know, the salt of the earth farmers and families that we all love be able to continue to live and, and live as we have. In the next five years, we're gonna see corporate takeover of all areas of California. And I believe that the family farmer is not gonna be even competing. The optimistic part of me says, you know, cannabis consumers are like organic food consumers and they care about where their cannabis comes from and they care about who grows it and they care about the impact of that cultivation on the earth and they care about how the people who worked for that cultivator were treated and that they will vote with their dollars and they will gravitate towards brands like Flocana that represent that type of farmer community. I'm also optimistic that the number of women in the cannabis space and the fact that women and older folks are the fastest growing segments of the market will yield some very innovative, interesting, family-friendly, supportive, nurturing products that aren't just so stark and driven by like, sexuality that we see when men are in charge, no offense. From a medical standpoint, I feel that more and more doctors are going to get on board, more and more research facilities will find that there is money for studying cannabis because at the end of the day, it makes dollars and cents and it makes sense. But you know, pharmaceuticals work on dollars and cents. So I would really enjoy having the medical community and the scientific community community come together with us growers and us consumers to create uh, more dialogue to further this education and involvement of this medicine. You're probably going to see more water-soluble 
time released rapid onset products. I mean, they're here now, they're making a face and I think they're, they're amazing products. And I think uh, labs and with the help of uh, some chemists with some nice PhDs, I think they'll be formulating a lot more tablets certainly onto the market. Um, for patient's sake, I would like to see them come in different routes of administration, maybe more suppositories for some you know, patients that are older um, that can't necessarily swallow large tablets. So delivery methods and more specific delivery systems. We're gonna have a whole host of novel cannabinoids come on the market. I mean, there's over 80 cannabinoids in the plant and we focus so much on CBD and THC. My prediction is that we're going to see THCV really come into play. So THCV is a very interesting cannabinoid. It's actually an appetite suppressant, but it has some of the same euphoric effects as THC. I think we're also looking at things like CBN, which is pretty much what happens to THC when it gets really old. It's why when you find like a super, super old joint, you smoke it, it puts you right to sleep because the THC has now become CBN. So I think in terms of looking at sleep aids and other things for people who are on sleep medications, that's really what we're going to see come through are these novel cannabinoids. And then I also think we're going to see more alternatives to smoking. I would love to see people still remain compassionate towards one another. I would love to see the giving and the trading of free cannabis. I would love to see people still going out of their way to make sure that their neighbor is okay. And I think that that's something that's um, kept me going all these years and I would love to see cannabis remain that way. The cannabis culture, cannabis people just tend to just, you know, live and let live, be chill, helping people out, just being nice, kind human beings. And uh, that culture is what we need a lot of in this country and in this world. You know, and that's what we got to bring back. We want to hold on to that culture, which is being led by our spirit ally and guide us back to that peaceful, inspirational way of living, being spiritual beings again. You know, and in conjunction with that, you're going to see a huge thing with the psychedelics. The psilocybin mushrooms being uh, legalized in Oregon and Oakland. That's time to come back too. How do we take a very highly regulated system that is, you know, the way California does business and ensure that the pieces of the culture that were very important from the beginning are not lost in that process. And it is a constant struggle and it is a constant give and take. If we want to take the Emerald Cup, we're taking it to England, we're going to take it to LA, we're going to take it around Canada. And we want to bring that culture and show people what that culture is. If we really want to benefit from legalization beyond just the legalization of cannabis, and what I mean is if we want to use this new access to cannabis to foster discussions about racism and gender disparity and economic disparity and environmental damage, then we need to preserve the parts of the cannabis culture like the social use, like the connection with the earth, because otherwise we're going to miss out on an opportunity to really make the most of this new access to the plant that's really unprecedented that we haven't seen before. I think it's important for passionate cannabis users to vote for the right people. When you're voting locally at the state level, research who you vote for. Before we even had regulation, it was really the consumer that was demanding more knowledge about their product. It wasn't that long ago that dispensaries had a brownie wrapped in cellophane with no label, no knowledge of what was in it or how strong it was. And they started testing product before it was required by the state. And it was patients who were coming in and saying, look, I can't just take any brownie. I need to know what this is going to do to me. So we started to see labels change. Um, we started to see ingredients put on labels. We started to see healthier edibles. You know, it was so sugar laden for so long. That was a direct response to consumers saying, I care about what I put in my body. And see, that's where I get my optimism that these consumers are going to go the right direction, that they're going to go towards the sun-grown products, the organic products, the small family farm products, because they've always showed us that they're that kind of conscientious consumer. The more we put an emphasis on organics, the better quality life we'll all live and future generations. I think that's one of the most important points that 
me personally as a grower has tried to put forward in my mission statement with Roots and Harmony Farms and all the various other things I'm interested in. I would like to really underscore the importance of maintaining the culture by having people have direct connection with the farmers. I think this is very, very important. And then we talk about maintaining that connection of culture and of social use and of the full circle of cannabis as a plant, we need to include the farmer. And so when I see a patient meet a farmer who grew their medicine, it is an extremely important moment. And I think we should all be looking at more ways to involve consumers with the producers. And that I think is really going to help cement the culture because that's what the farmers have. They have the culture. They are the keepers of the culture right now. Cannabis has an opportunity to disrupt all of these other systems that we don't like. Industrialized agriculture, big pharma, racial injustice in the criminal justice system. That's the optimistic side of me. The more realistic side of me says, we live in a capitalist society and money is what buys you success. And I see it happening already. And I see people getting into the industry that never would have set foot in the movement and be caught dead around those dirty hippies and their peace and love. But now that there's money to be made, including people that were against Prop 64, they're willing to throw their hat in the ring. And so my hope is that in this fight, good wins out over evil. But I think that's up to us. That's up to all of us, whether we're cannabis consumers and we're going to a dispensary or we're cannabis advocates or we're cannabis business leaders. We get to decide the cement is not dry. The most valuable information you can find is to just get involved in your local community, go to your city council meetings, push for, the, push for lower taxes, push for any, anything that you can on a regulatory level and you'll network and meet some amazing people. The number of companies that we, that we have the number of products that are being made, this profusion of new, 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 new things that are happening is going to begin to stabilize. Consumers will start choosing their favorites. Those favorites will start growing. Things that, that aren't chosen as favorites are gonna start disappearing from the marketplace. This is all gonna happen over a period of years, but it's the trajectory that you see in, in every other new growing business, and you'll see it with, with cannabis as well. I think we have an opportunity right now to really expose people to what we love so much about this plant. And with that comes a great responsibility. And in my mind, we will have folks from Nebraska and Kansas and Louisiana coming to California to visit farms and to try cannabis and to experience the culture. And we want them to return saying, this was amazing. Like we have to have this here. We need to change our laws. We don't want them to return saying I overdosed on a brownie in my hotel room by myself and it was the worst thing that ever happened. So I think that even though folks are tend to be afraid of social consumption and the idea of creating spaces for people to use cannabis out in public, I do believe it's going to be a really key piece to how this industry and this movement helps maintain the culture. The work that we do within the city of Alameda, making it safe, legal, it's going to impact a community, how, how we're going to do it can end up being a model for other cities of how you can have dispensaries in a community uh, with children and do it safely. I think it's really, really important that people who are new to cannabis understand that people paid some of the most heavy prices that human beings can pay to bring us to this point. Now, cannabis was almost wiped out in the United States in, in, in the early 1980s by Ronald Reagan and the whole just say no thing and a bunch of really hardy and brave people up in the Emerald Triangle, despite helicopters flying over their houses all the time, kept on planting those seeds and kept on nurturing that plant and kept on protecting her from people who would harm her, who would eradicate her completely from this planet. And they paid a heavy price. People were arrested. Uh, people had their homes seized. They were put on trial. They were ostracized. Their children were taken away from them. People were put in prison. People were killed. People died uh, in this war. Lives were ruined. Whole families' lives were ruined. And 
that should never be forgotten. We're going to have a very, very challenging moment for the people that built this industry. And so it's a double-edged sword for me. I'm really excited about where we're going, and I've got a real soft spot in my heart for, for the past. This group of people is being called upon really to make like the ultimate sacrifice now, right? to, to, take, to take this plant. Right? And when you sacrifice like that, you, it, it, it's natural, it's a human na natural emotion to, 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 to come to feel that that thing is yours, that it belongs to you, that you have paid the price in suffering so that this thing is yours. And, and, and there's a huge temptation to do that, right? I feel like I have a job to protect it from companies like Monsanto and Bayer and other massive corporations that have fused together to try to suck up every large resource that's available because they're trying to get genetic patents on everything they can. And this is something that shouldn't be patented. It's something that came from nature. People have no right to try to say they own this. Um, I think it's extremely important to nurture and foster um, access to plants that can heal people. I think it's important to realize that we are not here to necessarily profit off nature and that it's extremely important to be able to provide the access to patients and to people even just, um, you know, I, I refer to people sometimes as patients because I am a nurse and so it's a little bit ingrained in me. But uh, I think no matter what your status is when you walk into a dispensary, like you're using it for something. And so whether it's going to a party to feel happy or whether it's because you've just completed a round of chemotherapy, it's uh, you're a patient on some variety in my book. <laughs> For me, it's more about the medicine because the reality is, is when I'm able to help people, give them more time with their grandma like I didn't get, give them more time with people that have pain and seizures and problems like that, you can't put a price on helping somebody have their kid be free of seizures. we get enough of this plant into the hands of enough people quickly enough we can avert human beings from killing each other and cooking this planet through nuclear war or climate destruction or religious or racial intolerance or any one of the other things that's threatening to to blow the whole thing up right and and if we don't do it with cannabis i don't know how we do it I honestly will sit here and say that I've been through all of the red tape. I've owned a dispensary that I've recently just sold to Acreage Holdings. Um, and I find myself in a very happy position to where I can grow cannabis in my backyard and give it away. Just as happy as I am uh, being able to figure out how am I going to have a patient standing in front of me that uh, can't afford their medication and watch them pay these astronomical prices. Uh, a company can't afford to give a 99% discount to every person that walks in the door. And so that puts you in a very stressful position to make a dollar, to pay employees a living wage, and et cetera. Um, so I, I find that after going through the whole hoops, I'm capable enough to just grow it in my backyard and give it to people who need it. <laughs> The cannabis plant itself fosters community, and you can see it in the way that we circle up and we pass a joint. When that joint is going around and a new person walks up to the edge of the circle, we don't all huddle in and close our shoulders and make sure they don't get in. We all step out and we make a space and we welcome whoever it is 
that needs a little bit of that medicine. And it's one of the really beautiful things uh, about cannabis culture. So the plant itself teaches us to, to love our neighbors, to uh, welcome people who are different from us, to appreciate the things that make each of us unique. Pass the ditchy to the left hand side. Pass the ditchy to the left hand side. The joint should go to the right. Always pass it to the right. <laughs> Sometimes a second joint comes in because the circle's so big that it's taking kind of long, and then you send it in the opposite direction. I think that they should cross up and, and, and not follow one another and, and keep it keep it lively and interesting. Otherwise, you know, you could just keep the cycle going. Hey, I have my joint. Oh, keep it going. Usually it goes counter, and but somebody always ends up with two, and you kind of see it shift around as uh, different speeds. But if it's like, you know, that Becky over there did not get any, please, let's send the joint that way. I've never been particularly in, like, too rigid about the ideologies of pass it to the left or pass it to the right or any etiquette, because I'm usually typically just making it rain around and on to people. I'm running around dabbing everyone out or I'm sharing joints and rolling them up and sharing them with everyone whether they have something to contribute or not. It's all about making people feel comfortable, you know what I mean? So again, yes you want to send it to the left, but like if we're a prison to dogma, then Becky may never get it. It may just keep going right here. Sorry Becky, I tried. I, I kind of like putting it in the same direction because then it kind of forces the pace. People have passed it to the left. They've passed it to the right. They've smoked it in solitude, and they've smoked it in crowds. They've smoked it, they've rubbed it on their screen, they've put it in oil, they've dropped it over their head, they've bathed in it, they've put it in tents and breathed it in, and you know what? All of those ways are beautiful and, and joyous. And, and this is another one of the beautiful things about cannabis is that, that different groups of people, different cultures, can have their own rituals and their own ways. And I honor each and every one of those. I don't think it's so important which way you pass the joint or which way you ash your bowl or whatever the, the thing might be. And, it, and I also think that etiquette changes from area to area and for an individual as they grow. Mm -hmm.